So this is chapter 11. This is all about nucleic acids, about characteristics of DNA and RNA. We'll then go on to talk about protein synthesis and mutations, what happens when you have changes in DNA. And then we will finish this up with a kind of a second lecture about viruses, some background information. And then I want to specifically talk about the retroviruses, about HIV and the coronaviruses and how they are a little different and how COVID-19 sort of evolved. So first off, when we put nucleic acids, and remember in this, we're talking about deoxyribonucleic acids, as well as ribonucleic acids, DNA and RNA respectively. We've talked about all these different nutrients throughout this course, but putting them kind of in a size idea, I think it kind of helps to think about like how different they are from one another in terms of their size. So the smallest of all of the biomolecules we've talked about are definitely the simple sugars. So remember that these are things like glucose, fructose, maltose, sucrose. And when we talk about these, we're really talking about atoms that are up to 50, or sorry, molecules that are up to about 50 atoms in size. So this is sort of size per molecule. So less than 100. When we start talking about lipids though, lipids are really the next size. So triglycerides, your fats and oils, cholesterol. Now we're actually talking about hundreds of atoms in one molecule. When we go to proteins, so remember, proteins are chains of amino acids, and even just simple, um, a single amino acid in and of itself has somewhere upwards of about 50 atoms in a molecule, and then we can have amino acids that are now 100 um, we can have a, a hundred amino acids in one protein. So now we're actually talking about thousands of atoms. So this can be upwards of a thousand atoms, maybe 10,000 atoms in the larger ones. So remember when you're talking about things like protein, we're talking about stuff like collagen, hemoglobin, enzymes. So they are bigger than lipids, bigger than those simple sugars, but they still don't hold a candle to the nucleic acids. Of the two nucleic acids, the ribonucleic acids are the smaller, they are going to be, so this is when we talk, we're going to talk about this today. We'll talk about like mRNA, tRNA, rRNA, the different forms of RNA that come together and help produce proteins. Here we're talking about like 10,000 atoms in a single molecule. Tucked in between the two nucleic acids are the starches. So remember when we were talking about starch, talking about flour, talking about cellulose or fiber, even talking about glycogen. Here we're talking about 100,000 atoms typically in one molecule. They are larger than starches can be. 5,000 sugars all linked together. So 5,000 then you'd have to take and multiply that times 25. So we're talking about like 100,000 atoms in a molecule, but this is nothing compared to DNA. DNA by and large per molecule is the largest of all of the biomolecules found in the body. So here, this is your genetic information. And so when talking about DNA, it's just DNA, but here we're actually talking about millions billions of atoms. There's a billion. Much, much larger than any of the others. So just remember when we're talking about this in this chapter, we're talking about this genetic information. Thing to remember is you started off as a single fertilized cell. So when egg and sperm united, you get a new genetic makeup the offspring are going to have traits of mom and dad. They're a new combination of genetic information that controls what you look like, how tall you end up being, what diseases you might develop, even to some extent, like a lot of your physical personality, etc. All of that is determined by those nucleic acids. You go from being just one single fertilized cell to being trillions of cells in this large complex body. So DNA. So when thinking about DNA, 
things to remember. One, location. It's in the nucleus of the cell. So remember that when you think of a cell, that's typically where the nucleus, they always draw it in like the center. It's about 10% of the volume of the cell, and it contains this genetic information. The sequence of DNA, certain sequences compose what they call genes. So genes is, are a sequence of DNA that can be used to make a protein, whether it's making collagen, hemoglobin, or any of the thousands of enzymes that your body uses, they estimate that in a human genome, which just refers to the entire collection of DNA, is the genome. In the human genome, there's somewhere around 20,000 genes. Different cells use different genes to do their function. So for example, if you think about your red blood cells, they use the gene to make lots and lots of hemoglobin. But then your connective tissue cells, they're called fibroblasts, they actually use the gene for collagen to make lots of collagen to help build bones, to help build tendons and ligaments, cartilage, that's the job of those cells. So different cells will utilize different genes. Not every gene is used by every single cell. So they're very kind of specialized. So let's look at the structure, basic structure. So remember that amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, nucleic acids. Their building blocks are nucleotides. So they're sort of think of them as being the smaller components, just like glucose is the building blocks of all those polysaccharides. We have building blocks here as well. A nucleotide has three things. There is a base, and they call it an organic base. Oh, it's not like sodium hydroxide, like a base. The reason they call this, it's a nitrogenous base, and it's called a base because they can act as proton acceptors. So remember that that's one of the definitions of a base. Acids are proton donors. Bases are proton acceptors. So that's really where its name comes from. Two is a sugar. DNA is going to have deoxyribose. RNA is going to have ribose. Three, the phosphate group. So remember that the phosphate group is a polyatomic ion. It's that PO4 is the phosphate group, and it has a negative 3 charge. So all three of these components put together makes the nucleotide. DNA has about 3 billion nucleotides. So very, very large, very big molecule in comparison to any of these others. Now, here's the example, and you don't have to memorize which ones are which, but the nitrogenous bases, they call them that because they've got these nitrogens. I kind of like this structure better because it gives you, or this picture better because it shows sort of how they're a little bit different. So there are five. Four are found in DNA, four of which are found in RNA, three of which are the same. So these, adenine, guanine, and cytosine, these three nitrogenous bases are found in both DNA and RNA. So they're the same in both types. But the last one is only found in either DNA or RNA. Thymine is found in DNA. Uracil is found in RNA. And if you look at it closely, do you notice that there's only one difference? The only difference between thymine and uracil is there's a methyl group, a CH3 group on thymine that uracil doesn't have. But other than that, it's exactly the same. So they're very, very similar. So adenine, they like to abbreviate A, guanine abbreviate G, cytosine is C, thymine is T, and uracil is U. So if you see, a and C, G, T, or U, just remember that that's talking about those bases. So again, difference between, so DNA is really big, RNA is a little smaller. DNA has A, C, G, and T. RNA has A, C, G, and U. DNA has deoxyribose, and it's because it's missing an oxygen. It's deoxyed on carbon number two. 
whereas ribose has the normal ribose sugar. It is a pentose, okay? So remember, pentose means it's a five carbon sugar. And if you see, they have gone ahead and numbered the carbons. Remember how we numbered them back in um, chapter six. So this used to be, this carbon one used to be the one that was the double bonded oxygen when it was in a straight chain. So that means that this is an aldo pentose. Both of these are aldo pentoses. They used to have an aldehyde on carbon one that forms this ring and it's a pentose. So it only kind of makes like this little pentagon shape instead of the hexagon like glucose. So now if we put these together, so putting these together there is, here's one nucleotide, here's a second nucleotide. So here we have the base, the organic base linked to a sugar, linked to a phosphate. And if you would look, do you see that the phosphate is hooked to the fifth carbon? So see the little blue five with the little mark? That's the fifth carbon, and that's the one that the, the phosphate is linked to. Same thing with this second nucleotide. The phosphate is linked to the fifth carbon, the base is actually linked onto or attached to the first carbon, the carbon over on the far right side of the sugar. The link or forming the chain of the nucleic acid is when the third carbon, its alcohol group, links and attaches to the phosphate of the next nucleotide. This forms what they call a phosphodiester bond because it's where a phosphate is linked. And do you see, so it's this link right here. It forms that ester type of linkage. So that's where that name comes from. But it's a phosphate that forms in that connection. So a phosphodiester bond is what they call this linkage between the two. And it's always where on one end there is a five prime sugar um, carbon off of the sugar at the top. Down at the bottom then we end up with a three prime or the third carbon of that lower nucleotide has that open alcohol group. So we can kind of like continue this linking. A third nucle nucleotide could come in and link to that one and then another and then another so you end up with this chain but what this means is is you always start off there is ends up being sort of a beginning and an end so when you go to write any kind of nucleotides if you have the phosphate wherever the phosphate is on the end that's always going to be the five prime and that's because it's the five prime sugar or the five prime carbon on that sugar is connected to the phosphate and so then they link so this was one nucleotide linked second nucleotide linked, third nucleotide linked, fourth one. And we could keep doing this. You could just keep adding and notice that the backbone is actually the sugars and the phosphates. That's what forms the chain. The nitrogenous bases hang off of the sugar because remember they all hang off of that first carbon. Hang off, not really involved in making the chain, but they will become important. So this seems kind of a lot to write out phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. So you can actually abbreviate it and just put PS, PS, PS for phosphate and sugar. So this is sort of a shorthand version, but then you can even take and simplify it even shorter so that then you're just writing the nitrogenous bases, list them without even putting the phosphates and the sugars in. Do remember though, it doesn't mean that there isn't the chain, it's just showing the order of those nucleotides and they're identified based on the base that they are attached with. So G to T to C to A. And again, last thing to remember is there's sort of a direction, okay? So just like proteins have like a nitrogen end and a carboxylate end, the, they're sort of a left to right or direction like a sentence, same thing here, there is sort of a direction to the nucleic acid strand. So how did they figure out the structure of DNA and how it's arranged? So there was actually a couple of big discoveries and this was in the 1940s. So it's not even been a hundred years since this understanding of structure came about. And the first one, first one was Chargraff. So Chargraff, he looked at 
nucleic acids DNA from lots of different species, from lots of different sources, and he actually measured the amount of the different nucleotides and the nitrogenous bases that were found. He found that no matter if he was looking at one person's DNA or another's, or even looking at cat DNA, dog DNA, or even plant DNA, he found that there were these four nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And he found that adenine was always equal relative in amounts to thymine. And that guanine and cytosine were always equal. So he knew that there has to be a connection between them. So there's some kind of equal amounts or some kind of relationship between A and T and G and C. So Rosalind Franklin, she was a British chemist who used to do, her specialty was sort of what they called x-ray crystallography. So what she would do is she would take molecules and she would crystallize them, form them into solids, and then she would take x-rays of them. And these x-rays would actually help to show structure of large molecules. It didn't really help so much with little molecules like salt, but when you're talking about a great big molecule like DNA, we're talking about, you know, billions of atoms, you can actually take an x-ray of them to be able to see their shape. And she was the one that came up and said, based on her results, there was a spiral or helical shape to DNA. So Watson and Crick in 1953, they didn't really do a lot of research, but they pooled all of this information that was collected and had been published by different researchers like Shargaff and Franklin. And they said, okay, so if A's and T's have equal, have equal amounts, G's and C's have equal amounts, and there's a helix, how can we put the strands to make a helix? They determined that it was a double strand and that created a twisted ladder. The two strands have the phosphates and the sugars that make the sides of the ladder, and the bases form the rungs. Wherever adenine is, thymine is. Wherever guanine is, cytosine is. And looking at the chemical structure of adenine and thymine, they said they have to have the two strands actually have to run in opposite directions. So if one strand goes from five to three, the other strand goes from three to five. So they say they're anti-parallel. This is because when you flip the strands and run them backwards, A and T hydrogen bond, G and C hydrogen bond, and that helps hold the strands together as that double-stranded helix. So here's the shape. And remember, we're talking about strands that collectively have 3 billion A and T base pairs in one nucleus of a cell. So here's how it looks. So the purple strands, those are the sugars and the phosphates. Sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate running down the strands. Notice that we one strand runs from 5 prime to 3 prime. The other one runs from three prime to five prime, so they're anti-parallel. When you do this, see how G and C create the hydrogen bonding. So this complementary shape, same thing up here, A and T, hydrogen bonding that can occur to help hold these two strands together. So Watson and Crick ended up getting a Nobel Prize in chemistry for the work that they did they were really good at like pooling information together. Lots of scientists were studying different parts about this, but they ended up putting it all together. Now we have the sequence of DNA is considered its primary structure. So the fact that you have the A to T base pair, the G to C base pair, and the order of that base pair, because remember this, so if you come back and look, so on this side, notice that this one, you would say that this base pair sequence, it would be A, T, G, C, G, A, T, T, A, C, G, G, C. That's what they call the primary structure. It's just the order of the base pairs. So this would be considered one base pair, B, 
because it's where A and T or G and C are paired. And that order is what's the primary structure of the DNA. The secondary structure is this double-stranded helix. So this twisting that occurs, this stable arrangement of the helix twist, that is considered the secondary structure. But now, if we took three billion base pairs of DNA and we had it all on one strand, it would actually stretch out to about six feet. That's really far. So I know if I have thread and I have more than about two feet of thread, it tends to knot. So the way that the cell keeps these very, very thin strands from twisting, knotting, and ending up breaking is by wrapping them. So one, they get wrapped or spooled around what are called histones. So DNA with the phosphate is negatively charged. So the PO4 with the three minus. So this negative charge gives DNA a negative charge. Histones are positively charged. And you know opposites attract. So you can see here these little yellow spools that kind of look like little round spheres, but the DNA wraps around them, negative to positive attracts, and that begins to wrap it a lot like how thread gets wrapped onto a spool or how yarn is wrapped into a skein. Like when you buy yarn, you don't buy it loose. It comes all balled up into kind of like an oblong structure. That helps to keep the yarn organized. The strands don't get twisted. They don't get knotted. They stay organized. And that is the tertiary structure of DNA is caused by what they call supercoiling. So this extra coiling causes the DNA to wrap back on itself. And this is what forms chromosomes. So this is a chromosome. Chromosomes are not actually present in the nucleus all the time. They are really how your cells wrap the DNA up so that the cell can go through cell division. So if you remember back at mitosis, mitosis is just the process of cell division, chromosomes form during the, the steps of mitosis. And the reason is, is it actually decreases the length of the DNA strand by about a million and it increases the width of the strand by about a million so that it takes something that would be a couple feet long and shortens it so that it's microscopically short. And that's gonna help organize the DNA and be able to separate it when the cell splits from one cell into two. So now we're gonna go on and kind of put these two together. But we've talked sort of about DNA and RNA without like being super descriptive, but I like this page because it shows kind of like it's a compare and contrast. So do remember DNA is a double strand. Well, RNA, we haven't talked about as much, but I will tell you that RNA exists as a single strand. DNA has that deoxyribose as its sugar. RNA has ribose. DNA has those nitrogenous bases, A and T, G and C, that pair. Well, RNA has A and U, G and C, and tends to remain as a single strand. Sometimes it has some folding to it. It's not just like a piece of string, but it does not exist as that double-stranded helix. There's a huge difference in size. So remember that I told you that DNA versus RNA, a lot of difference in size. Well, DNA is about 3 billion base pairs. So if we comma, 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 3 billion base pairs of make up the nucleotides in just a single cell. RNA, on the other hand, is much smaller. Only 500 to maybe 5,000 nucleotides in size. So much, much smaller. And the reason is because of their job. The reason that DNA is so large is because it's the complete set of genetic information. This gets copied every time the cell has to go through cell division. A complete copied set goes to every new daughter cell when a cell divides. This stays in the nucleus. Because remember, this is the complete set of genetic information that tells the cell how to make every protein it needs, even directs the cell to go through cell division and controls the development of that cell. RNA, on the other hand, it is smaller because it's actually only made from a specific region of DNA, those regions that are called genes. 
that RNA then is made only when the cell needs that specific protein. RNA is used then in order to synthesize that protein in a process that they call protein synthesis. So in looking at this, this is sort of the whole middle chunk of this chapter. You will take DNA. One part of the DNA, the gene, is transcribed. The process is called transcription. So we're going to take DNA, the double-stranded helix. We are going to use that sequence of the gene to make or synthesize a complementary sequence of RNA. And that sequence of RNA now can be translated into an amino acid sequence into the protein. The first part of protein synthesis, transcription, occurs in the nucleus of the cell because it occurs where the DNA is located. The second part, translation, where RNA is used to produce a protein, takes place in the cytoplasm of the cell because that's where the organelle, the, the ribosomes are located, and where your collection of amino acids are found. So those amino acids need to get put in, linked together, forming peptide bonds in the right order in order to form a functional protein. So RNA. There's three different types of RNA. So yes, they're all single-stranded. They're all relatively short and small in terms of their size. But these, all three of these types are involved in protein synthesis. So first we'll sort of talk about them and then I'll show you how they come into play. So first there's messenger RNA and I will tell you that oftentimes it's called mRNA. So M is short for messenger. This is the sequence of RNA that is made from the gene of DNA. So this is what's made in the nucleus of the cell from a specific sequence of DNA and this ends up getting transferred into the cytoplasm. Then we have ribosomal RNA or rRNA is the common term. rRNA is just what helps make up part of the ribosome. Ribosomes are the very small organelles found inside of the cell. If you remember back to your biology in the human cell, they look like specks. They just look like these little dots, specks scattered throughout the inside of the cell. So they're kind of like considered like the smallest of the organelles and they're made of protein and rRNA, those two components together. The third one, transfer RNA. Its name tells you what it does. Transfer RNA are sometimes referred to as tRNA, and their job is to make sure that they bring the right amino acid to the ribosome so that the ribosome can link the amino acids together in the right order to form a specific protein. Okay, so let's talk about the first step. So remember that I said that we have DNA. And we got to go through transcription to make that RNA and really we're making mRNA. So in order to do this, here's the steps. DNA, we know it's a double-stranded helix. So the DNA double-stranded helix unwinds at a gene. Right, so it unwinds at a specific sequence and an enzyme called RNA polymerase uses one of the strands of DNA that's been pulled apart, uses one of the strands to synthesize a complementary strand of messenger RNA. So when RNA polymerase reads the template strand of DNA, if there's a C, it will match a G. If there is a G, it'll match a C. If there is a T, it will match an A. But now if there's an A, that RNA polymerase is going to place a U because that's an RNA form. The sugars of those nucleotides are all ribose instead of deoxyribose. So there are some differences. This enzyme recognizes the difference and only will put RNA nucleotides into this RNA strand. So just know there are sequences on the DNA that direct the RNA polymerase to the gene sequence. 
And I always think of it as sort of like if you're if you have a sentence like see the boy run, you would capitalize the first letter of the sentence and you put a period at the end. Well, literally in the DNA, there are sequences that are just like a capital letter that tells the RNA polymerase this is the beginning of the gene. And then there are sequences at the end of the gene that tells the RNA polymerase this is the end. So they call them like like promoter or initiator sequences and then terminator sequences so that the, the enzyme actually knows what's the length, where is the correct sequence of that gene. So once the RNA is made, it gets released from the DNA strand. The DNA strand snaps back into its double-stranded helix and the RNA polymerase releases. So we can see it here. So this is sort of going in the middle. So this big gray blob is RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase, here it's already attached to the DNA. Where it's attached, it unwinds the DNA, right? So we said the first thing, we unwind the DNA. And then we're going to use one strand of the DNA. They call it the template strand because the template is kind of the pattern. to form a complementary strand of RNA. So notice here, they have the purple as being DNA. So the nucleotides that come in are RNA nucleotides. They have ribose and they have uracil, no thymine in this one. Everywhere there's a G, it'll match a C. Everywhere there's a C, it matches a G. Any T's get an A, any A's will get a U. So it will link and synthesize this. So notice the direction that it's going. We use the template DNA strand to form what I call a complementary strand of RNA. And so you can see that here. So the RNA polymerase just slides along the DNA, unwinding, matching to the template strand until it gets all the way to the end. Once it gets to the end, there's an ending sequence and it tells the, the RNA polymerase this is the end of the gene. At that point, it detaches from the DNA. It releases the new mRNA. And this newly made mRNA has to be transported to the cytoplasm. So it's going to come out of the nucleus and go out into the broader part of the cell. So remember when we drew the cell, the little nucleus is here in the very center. And so now the RNA is going to come out. And in the cell are all those little specks, the ribosomes, that are going to come into play for the second. So for example, in this one, and we'll actually use this one again. So if we have a DNA strand, here's the 5 to 3, here's the 3 to 5. We are going to use the bottom strand as the template strand. So if the RNA polymerase starts on this left side, if there's a T, it'll put an A. So the RNA strand will match, an A will be a U, a C gets a G, and it'll link these together. Then T is A, A is U, G is C. Then the next three, so C is G, A makes U, then I see four G's in a row, Right, C, C, C makes G, G, G. Then G is C, C is G. A, A makes U, U. C is a G. Then I see four U's in a row. Then an A. Then one, two, three, four. Then four C's in a row. Then two U's. Then a C is a G. And the last one is an A. These are all linked together. So this long line would be sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate linked together. This is going to be at the five prime and this one will be a three prime because they're always opposite. They're always anti-parallel. So it uses this strand to make the mRNA strand. Does that make sense? So we're going to say at this very end is sort of where the ending gene sequence is just passed. So this is going to end up being our piece of mRNA. RNA polymerase releases the DNA, it snaps back, and now this is going to go into the cytoplasm.
Once it gets into the cytoplasm, now the other forms of RNA are going to come into play. So I told you there's a ribosome. So ribosome is the organelle that's found inside of the cytoplasm that is made of R R RNA or ribosomal RNA and protein. And in fact, I'll just tell you now, this reminds me of like a hamburger bun. So the top of the bun is the large piece, the bottom of the bun is the small, and it's just two different proteins. It's really two different parts that kind of sandwich together and see what goes in the middle. So that sequence we just made gets set down right in between the two. Ribosome is really interesting because the ribosome is not just an organelle. It actually is going to act like an enzyme. Its job is to match amino acids to this gene sequence in that mRNA form and link them together into a protein. Transfer RNA, so the tRNA is the other type of RNA. Transfer RNA, I told you its job is to transfer amino acids to build this new protein. So here is what the tRNA looks like. And I will tell you, I always think of tRNA as looking like some bent up coat hanger. So it is a little twisted, it's not completely straight, but on one end, it has a specific amino acid. The amino acid it carries is completely based on its sequence on the other side of the tRNA. So they call this sequence an anticodon because this sequence has to complement the sequence on the RNA on the mRNA, they call this sequence the codon. So the codon sequence, the three base sequence on the mRNA is going to match or complement the three base sequence on the tRNA and that will allow those two to come together. That's gonna tell this tRNA and also the ribosome that this is the amino acid that belongs in this position. If a different tRNA sits there, notice how these shapes complement each other. If a different tRNA tries to fit in this spot, they do not complement each other and it'll just get pushed out of the way. So you've got this whole collection of tRNAs in the cytoplasm, each with their own specific amino acid. Remember there's 20 different amino acids and they're all there trying to match and fit onto this space and it's the ribosome, ribosome's job to make sure they match. So let's do this. Okay, so now we've got that mRNA that we made a couple slides back and we'll use it in the next couple of slides, but here's what's going to happen. So the ribosome is always going to start at a very specific three base order called AUG. So adenine, uracil, guanine, that is always like the start, right? So it's like telling, tells the ribosome attach right here. When the ribosome attaches, that AUG sequence will allow a tRNA to come down and bind to it if it has a complementary sequence. So that means that the tRNA that is going to be complementary to that AUG is going to be a UAC. Do you see that AUG and UAC are complementary that U and A would complement, C and G would complement to form this connection. Well, this is always carrying a specific amino acid. The amino acid is called methionine. So maybe you remember that one. It's MET is its short version, but it's always going to be the very first amino acid on a protein. It might get knocked off later. It might get clipped off when the protein gets modified, but that's always kind of like the very first amino acid in the chain. And that basically kind of like primes the ribosome to start sliding down that mRNA and forming protein. So how do you know? Okay, well this, this is the codon sequence. So remember that the codon is the three bases on the mRNA. It's always sets of three. So if you look, there's AUG. So see where it says MET, which is methionine. That is the name of the amino acid, MET or START. So that is always the very first sequence on the mRNA. 
and it's always going to be a met, the thionine, that's going to be the amino acid at the beginning. Now, there's this is two different ways to read the genetic code. This second one, you always start at the beginning. Here is code 1, 2, and 3. So can you see A, U, and G? And that's the met or start point. Now, as soon as that AUG is in place, as soon as the tRNA holding the AUG is in place, now we can start elongation. So the ribosome will go down three bases, match another tRNA that based on the next three bases on the mRNA called the codon. Now you've got two tRNAs side by side and you have an amino acid on each of them. So now I have, so my funny looking little tRNAs. So I know that with the first one, I know that I have, it's MET, right? So now when the second one comes along, whatever this one is, I'll just call it amino acid number two. When this is on the ribosome side by side, the ribosome will act like an enzyme and it's gonna do a condensation reaction to link these two together. So it is going to form a peptide bond between the carboxylate group on the methionine and the nitrogen group on the second amino acid. In doing that, by making this link, it actually breaks the connection that the methionine had, MET, had with, amino, with the tRNA carrying it. That breaks that off. So now this amino acid too is linked to methionine and then this tRNA is still stuck to the ribosome. This old tRNA or the what they call the empty tRNA, it basically just falls off. It gets released and it can actually go get another methionine put on it and then be reused later. So these tRNAs are really just carriers. They get their specific amino acid take it to the ribosome. When they get comp a complementary match, they get used in forming this. Ribosome slides down three, acts like an enzyme, forms that peptide bond, and that releases the tRNA as the ribosome slides down the next three bases. It's going to then expose the next three bases on the mRNA, allowing another tRNA to come in. So we start this. And this is just going to continue. As long as there is a sequence, the ribosome slides down three bases, matches a tRNA, forms a peptide bond. Slides down three bases, matches a tRNA, forms a peptide bond. So we can actually do that with this one. Okay, so here's the first one. And now I, I may have to and I, I left this one up. This is really my favorite. That circle one, I don't like it so much, but this one is like the one that I'm used to looking at for the genetic code. So we're gonna start off here. And this is the ribosome, right? So that always starts at AUG. And so now it is carrying MET, right? So if you look at the code, AUG means that MET is the amino acid it's carrying. Oops, sorry, direction. So there, that's my initiation, is that binding, that initial spot. I'm going to change, so I'm going to move the ribosome down three. So now I have AUC. So AUC, looking at the genetic code, here's AUC. So that means that this AUC is going to be carrying ILE, which is isoleucine, not one that you have to know, right? So now do you see that these two tRNAs side by side on the ribosome, and now the ribosome is going to link these. Forms a peptide bond linking them together and breaks the link on the tRNA that was attached to the MET. So this one is gonna be able to just disappear, right? So the ribosome is gonna move down three, and I got G, 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 U, G, sorry, G, U, G. So find G, U, G, G, U, G. So G, U, G is right here. And so see that its amino acid is called B, A, L, which is valine. So here comes in a new tRNA carrying V, A, L. And the ribosome is gonna link these two and break the link to the tRNA behind. 
change color again, slide down three. Now see, I have code on GGG. So going forward, looking for GGG, there it is. And that means that glycine is going to be the amino acid that's going to match. So GLY, amino acid forms the link, breaks the connection to the tRNA that was holding valine, keeps on going down, moves down three, CGU. So when I find CGU, CGU, right there, the amino acid is called arginine or ARG. So this one, the tRNA is going to have ARG attached. That's the tRNA that matches CGU is ARG. Ribosome forms the link, breaks the connection to the glycine. So I'm just going to keep going. My suggestion, stop this. You can flip back and forth on your PowerPoint. See if you can match UGU, UUU, ACC, CCU, and then UGA. So I'm just going to go through each one. I'm going to move my ribosome down three. tRNA is going to come in. It's got to match UGU. So UGU is right here. So it's CYS. So CYS is the amino acid that's on that tRNA. Form the peptide bond. Break the link to the one that had the ARG. Now I'm going to slide down three more. Amino acids got to come in and it's UUU. So I need to find the UUU right here, phenylalanine. So I gotta go to, so it's P-H-E. P-H-E is the amino acid that that tRNA is carrying. Peptide bond is formed, breaks the link to the outer, the, the back tRNA. Move down three. Then ACC, so look on the chart. Find what the abbreviation for the amino acid for ACC. So if I go here, it's right there. So THR, which stands for threonine, THR connection, breaks this link. So right now I have this black tRNA it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight amino acids hanging off. So all of these other ones have like disappeared as we've gone through. So that one's gone, this one's gone. So notice all of these and the ribosome is not in this space anymore. So even if you wanted to think like these ones are all gone. Oh, not that last one. The last one's still there. So the last one right here is like that. So now this is sort of the position. Ribosome is going to slide down three. Move down three. Almost there. And this last one is... Oh, Look now, don't be doing any mutations today. Go down three, and it's this one, sorry. So CCU. If I look, CCU is right here, so it's PRO for proline. PRO. It's going to get formed, breaks the link to this one. Now I get to the end. So get to this last one. Ribosome then wants to move down three, but when the ribosome slides down this last three, and there's UGA, when you find, do you see UGA, UAA, and UAG? These ones are called stop sequences. So that, a little bit about that, the ribosome is going to encounter what they call a stop codon. That is a three base sequence that does not match any tRNA. And literally, this is the signal to the ribosome that it's at the end of the protein. So it causes termination. So the new protein, which is a polypeptide, that's just a fancy name for a protein, it's just a chain of a lot of amino acids. This protein now gets released from the ribosome. The ribosome releases the mRNA. And this now, this polypeptide or this little protein, can begin folding. So remember when we talked about proteins having secondary structure, they make those alpha helixes. 
the beta pleated sheets, and they start to create tertiary structure where you have hydrophobic and hydrophilic areas of the protein. If they have to merge with other proteins and become a, a complex with quaternary structure, they do that as well. So all that happens like after this protein is formed. Because this says stop. And so the ribosome releases. And there's your protein. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine amino acids. And all those links are peptide bonds, right? Remember, those are the bonds between proteins. Okay? So there it shows kind of like some of this folding that starts to occur. This, remember, or really this is just showing like, remember, this is transcription that happens in the nucleus where you get your RNA, mRNA from the DNA. And then this long blue strand is the mRNA. And there's the ribosome just sliding along, going along every three bases, matches the tRNA. So here, based on this structure, that's going to determine what this amino acid is. Then we're going to have a peptide bond formed. Ribosome is going to slide down three. Just going to keep doing it until it gets all the way to that termination sequence. So now the last topic, which is really like the reason to talk about this is, you know, it's all fine and good to understand protein synthesis, but how does this relate to you? And how does this relate like to more of the biology? So any change in the DNA sequence is called a mutation. So we have 3 billion nucleotides in the DNA of the nucleus of one single cell. Any change in the sequence, the AT pairs, the GC pairs, any change at all is a mutation. So when people think of mutations, they always think of things going wrong. Well, in fact, most mutations are what they call silent. Silent mutations do nothing. They have no change in how your cells work, no change in how your body functions, no change even to the proteins that are made. Why? Well, one thing is sometimes a mutation doesn't even change the sequence. So for example, if we go back to that genetic code, more. if we go here, notice if we have a mutation from UUU to UUC, it would still be PHE. It wouldn't change the amino acids. Like for glycine, glycine's got a lot of them. Glycine, any of these, as long as the first two are GG, it's glycine. So if we have a mutation from GGU to GGA, it would still be the same amino acid. Second thing that can be a silent mutation is if it changes, but it's a polar amino acid and it's the mutation still creates the code for a polar amino acid, then it's not really going to change the shape of the protein. So remember how we talked about how some, pro how some amino acids have alcohol groups in them. Some amino acids have nitrogen groups. So some have a, a polar nature to them. So if we switch from one polar amino acid to another, then it still wouldn't change the structure of the protein. Third thing, it is actually estimated in your 3 billion base pairs of DNA that there's only about 3% of that sequence is where genes are. So there's a lot of ATGC pairs that don't correspond to a gene area. So changes in those areas would really have no effect on what proteins are made. So there's a lot of what they call this non-coding non-coding areas of DNA really affect the structure and stability of the DNA, but it doesn't necessarily change what the genes are. So these, they think this just really adds to more genetic diversity within species. Why we have, like why you can actually look at one person's DNA and see that it's different from another's is because of mutations that have happened that have still not affected how someone has lived. But what if there is a change. Some of the changes that can cause changes in the way that a protein is shaped, there's these examples, a substitution. 
So in a substitution mutation, a polar amino acid might get swapped out for a non-polar amino acid. And that's going to possibly change the shape of the protein. This is actually how sickle cell, sickle cell disease is a single substitution where a polar amino acid becomes a non-polar amino acid and that affects the shape of the hemoglobin protein. Termination. Termination mutations mean if a, you have a codon, a three-base sequence that codes for an amino acid, and there's a mutation, and now that becomes a stop codon, you can end up having something that was 100 amino acids end up being something that maybe is only 45 because there is a stop codon in the middle of the gene now. So that means that gene is not going to have the total number of amino acids in the chain. And you can see that would definitely affect how well that protein would function because now it's less than half its size. Third one. So the third one they call a frame shift. So in a frame shift, this is if you add or remove a base in the gene sequence that so if I have like A T T C G G A U A, not U, sorry, <laughs> A T A T T, right? So if that's, we'll just say that's like the template. If I have that, then right, there's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So those are the sequences. So what would happen if I added, if a frame shift would be like, well, what happened if I add a C here? Now I'd have A T T C C G. G, A, T, A, T, T. So that means the first one, the first codon is the same, A, T, T. But now the second codon, see that it's totally different. Instead of C, G, G, now it's C, C, G. And every single codon after is going to be shifted. So that tends to have a pretty big effect on what amino acids are going to be used to build this protein. So termination, frame shift, substitution typically have much bigger effects on protein function. This can have or create disease. So here's a list. These are all genetic diseases. Cystic fibrosis. This is a mutation in a gene that regulates salt transport. So you end up with not enough salt and water in the secretions like mucus, digestive juices. They end up with a lot of respiratory complications, really thick mucus to get respiratory infections a lot. Down syndrome. So this change actually leads to an extra chromosome pair being formed, which can cause a lot of cognitive physical issues for, for an offspring. Sickle cell anemia. I told you that that was a single base substitution but it changes the shape of the hemoglobin protein. Remember, hemoglobin carries oxygen, so changing the shape means that that protein doesn't carry that oxygen very well. Even things like hemophilia. Hemophilia is a clotting disease where you don't produce the blood clotting proteins that you need, and so they have poor coagulation. They bleed very easily. Oftentimes, they end up hemorrhaging internally. So these are all passed on genetic mutations you can also just have this cell might die. So if there's a mutation in a specific cell, that cell might die. Also, though, that you can have a mutation in parts of the DNA that help to control how quickly a cell grows. So they call those controllers over cell cycle or cell division control. And so mutations can sometimes lead to abnormal cell growth. So a cell doesn't grow under the control that it should have, and it ends up forming a mass of cells that can lead to tumors. Sometimes those spread, and that can ultimately lead to cancer. So these are kind of like outcomes of what can happen with significant changes to protein sequences because of mutation. So then the last thing, so what causes a mutation? So mutations can be spontaneous. A spontaneous mutation is just a mutation that happens typically when DNA replication can occur occurs. So the DNA, 3 billion base pairs, has to be doubled. You have to have 6 billion base pairs in the nucleus of a cell before a cell can divide in mitosis. 
So my question is, if I told you you had to copy six billion letters, do you think you would ever make a mistake? Right? I mean, I do that and like I'm when I type like 20 letters, <laughs> I would not be a very good um, replicator for DNA, but that's why mutations can occur. A lot of those mutations actually get repaired. So you have enzymes that look at the DNA and try to find mutations, and most mutations are repaired. So an example is, so if I have A, T, T, A, C, C, G, or G, G, okay? And so you know that its pair would be this, right? And those complement or, or have normal complementary base pairing. But if there's a mutation, that could actually change this so that I would end up with one strand being like this, the other strand like this. So here, notice that the T's get mismatched. Well, what that does, two T's do not hydrogen bond well, so they will form like a bump in the gene or in the DNA sequence. Because they don't hydrogen bond, they can't fit together like A and T and G and C can, and that can typically get picked up. So that'll get picked up by repair enzymes that are always feeling the DNA, kind of sliding along that double-stranded helix, looking for bumps in the strands, and that can get pulled out, repaired, and then it's back to its normal place. So many of the spontaneous mutations get fixed, you can also have mutations because of what are called mutagen. So a mutagen is something that causes mutation. You can have mutagens that are chemical. And so think things that are pesticides, herbicides, insecticides. These are things that kill other living things. So if they have the ability to cause damage to living things, they oftentimes have the ability to cause changes in the DNA. So mutagens can come from chemicals. There are some food chemicals like M&Ms used to be made with a red dye that they found was actually a mutagen. <laughs> so they took it off the market. Sometimes they know these things, sometimes they don't. And so this was just, there's plenty of examples of those trying to make sure that you're trying to limit your exposure to these types of mutagens, which is why you wear gloves. You wash your hands after you've like sprayed Roundup in the heart, just to try and make sure that you're not ingesting and you're not having too much um, physical exposure to mutagens in the, from chemicals. The other one though, energy. Best example, ultraviolet light, right? So also remember that nuclear radiation we talked about like when we were talking about Chernobyl, talking about that back in chapter two, nuclear energy, how to protect yourself with barriers and such, because energy can also cause mutation, can cause an error in the DNA. And if that error doesn't get replaced or repaired, then it may end up having long-term effects. So ultraviolet light is the one that most people think of. And so everybody knows, like, if you have fair skin and you have multiple sunburns, especially in childhood, that increases your risk of developing skin cancer. Third one. Third one, viruses. So viruses we're going to talk about in the next lecture. Viruses, some viruses like to actually insert their genetic information into human genetic information. So a virus that infects you may try to insert its genetic information into your DNA, and then that can sometimes lead to mutations. So last topic on this, somatic versus germ. Okay, So somatic, a somatic cell is any cell that's not an egg or sperm. So this would be like a skin cell, muscle cell, nerve cell, bone cell, okay? Any kind of cell that's not an egg or sperm is considered a somatic cell. Somatic cells, if there's a mutation in a somatic cell, it's typically only going to affect that person. So for example, if you get lots of sunburns as a child, you may have a mutation in a specific cell and develop a melanoma or a carcinoma, but it's only going to affect those cells. It might affect you, it might lead to cancer, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be passed on to any children that you have. 
children come from germ cells. So don't think about germs like bacteria. When you think about germ cells, they're talking about only eggs and sperm. Trying to minimize mutation to germ cells. Remember, this is why you put the lead shield on the patient around their waist, protecting the pelvis, trying to make, make sure that any reproductive organs are limited in exposure when doing x-rays. Because mutations in a germ cell can become a genetic disease. So if you have a mutation in, and as a female, I get a mutation in one of my eggs. That egg then matures, it ends up being fertilized by sperm, and now my offspring is going to have that mutation. And then their offspring will have that mutation, and so on and so on. So those are those, when they, when they talk about a genetic disease, this is just a disease that is being passed from one parent to an offspring because of a mutation that happened in those germ cells. So I'm going to quit there. I will do the viral lecture, which will be much shorter than this one, but that will cover sort of the very back part of chapter 11.